I'm a professor here at UNBC, and we hold uh, regular public presentations every second Wednesday over the noon hour. So if you're not on our notification list and would like to be uh, notified by email as these lectures come up, uh, please see me afterwards and I'll get your email address. There's a, there's a list outside the door of remaining lectures uh, in this uh, fall series. Some of them are uh, more or less discussion groups around topical issues. Some of them are film viewings and uh, discussion sessions. And some of them are uh, presentations by uh, university faculty or staff uh, around their area of expertise or their current research, sometimes graduate students or even just uh, local uh, commentators uh, and, uh, and personalities. For example, uh, I think our last uh, lecture uh, in the series is from Rod, Rod Link, will be talking about his role as an editor of the Paris Standard. So I've got some penetrating questions for him, so I'm sure some of you in the audience might as well. So today for this record audience, we have a triumvirate of presenters. Uh, a good friend and colleague of mine is Rob Rice from UNBC. He's involved in their continuing studies uh, network, uh, originally from Prince George, but then went off to school at SFU and did some more uh, uh, forest tech training at uh, College of New Caledonia. Uh, for the last many years, he's been involved not just in forestry extension programs, but also in developing sort of an adventure tourism experiential learning uh, component to uh, UNBC's offerings. And, and uh, this uh, presentation, in fact, stems in part from uh, their, their success in that area. Uh, Kelsey Weave, who just step, stepped out of the room, I'm sure most of you know as the curator at the, uh, at the Heritage Museum up on the hill there, she is a UNBC graduate in the, from the Department of History. And I suspect it's that her extensive network uh, that has brought people here today. And I don't know, Ken Newman? That's right. All right. Hi. Yeah. Pleased to meet you. Uh, Ken is a planner with the City of Terrace right. and uh, comes from a, from a planning background, but also I take it with a, 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 a long time interest in history. Yes. So I'm told they have a full hour's presentation for us here, but hopefully there will be uh, time for questions at the end and maybe we can get a, a few more chairs in the room as needed. I don't think we're breaking the fire code yet, but we're getting close. <laughs> Uh, take it away, whoever's on deck first. That's me. Okay. Bro. Well, great. Um, glad to be here. It's a nice turnout. So as Phil mentioned, this is kind of a, a bit of an offshoot of one of our educational travel tours um, called Ghost Towns in Northwest BC that we've run the last uh, couple of summers in August. So um, and I'm glad to have Kelsey and uh, Ken here. They both help us out with the, uh, the tour that we do. They actually do some of the presentations in the evenings for our guests. So we decided to come up with a little uh, lecture series here uh, talk and uh, have myself, Kelsey and Ken uh, uh, kind of whip through these five ghost towns. So it will be just kind of a teaser. I mean, we could spend you know, a couple hours on each of these ghost towns. So we have 10 minutes to go through five ghost towns. So we'll, um, I'll keep it short uh, and we'll uh, jump right into the, uh, the first ghost town. So, you can see the list of them here that we're going to talk about. Alice Arm, Antioch, Kids Hall, Doreen, and Port Essington. All uh, prominent uh, Northwest BC ghost towns. And I'll jump right in by uh, starting to talk about Alice Arm. So, uh, just had a little uh, blurb there on the other uh, two presenters. And then where is, um, or where are these ghost towns? So, Terrace is down here. Um, the first one I'll be talking about is Alice Arm. So this is in the actual Alice Arm. We actually take a uh, bus up to King Coleth and then a boat. Uh, depending on the boat, uh, it could be an hour to three hours down to Antioch. We spend a night there and then the next day we go to Alice Arm over across the Bay to Kitsault and then back to Terrace. And then we, uh, we do a trip with jet boats up to Doreen and then the same thing down to Port Essington. So those are the five ghost towns, kind of give you a geographic um, idea of where they're all located in, in Northwest BC and fairly remote as you can see, um, especially the ones up here on the observatory inlet are really our uh, remote locations that are very difficult to get to. So Alice Arm, I thought I'd start out with a little then and now. So just to give you a bit of history on Alice Arm, named after uh, Alice Tomlinson, after um, I guess his uh, or uh, Robert Tomlinson's wife, Alice. So the, the actual arm was uh, named after Alice. Uh, Robert was a missionary, Anglican missionary that was stationed in King Coleth at the time and uh, named after an uh, army commander, a Navy commander, Daniel Pender. 
So, and a little bit of history on Robert Tomlinson. If you want to see his um, grave site out in uh, Cedarvale, or I think it's called Minchkinisht, um, they have a cemetery there. I was out there um, a couple weeks ago, actually, with one of the locals, and um, they were telling me a little bit about the site and a lot of history with um, with Robert Tomlinson in this area as a as an Anglican uh, minister. So that's how it uh, how the town got its name. Um, it really started though with four Scandinavian uh, prospectors who were out and about in the region looking for uh, the next big uh, I guess gold rush or silver rush and they were uh, exploring up the Kitsault River Valley and discovered some silver deposits quite a ways up this, this big rugged valley. Um, it went through a series of different uh, companies and people having ownership and eventually uh, started out with the Dolly Varden Silver Mine uh, company starting production in 1917 up in this rugged uh, valley, basically uh, at the end of Alice Arm. So by 1919, they put a, a 23 kilometer narrow gauge railway up this valley, lots of steep canyons and uh, lots of uh, you know, weather, um, um, bad weather conditions, you know, lots of snow and rain, lots of uh, um, you know, mudslides and other things kind of hampering their efforts up there. So um, between 1923 and 27, the, um, the railway was actually uh, used for logging operations, a big, huge, um, I guess, estuary, mud flat, cemetery, or, um, area there at the, uh, the head of Alice Arma. They took a lot of logs out and ran those right down and uh, used those to uh, build some of the other um, ghost towns out in the, uh, in the area. About 20 million ounces of silver were produced between 1919 and 1959 by a variety of companies. So these uh, silver mines actually changed hands quite a few times over that period. And um, in that period, you can see they still took out a lot of, uh, a lot of silver out of the area. There was a lot of hazards with that railway. Uh, it went bankrupt a number of times. So a lot of the companies that had ownership of the area actually went bankrupt and transferred from one company to another. And just with the challenges of keeping that railway open the entire time, they, uh, they would go bankrupt every once in a while. Um, it did have a one-room uh, school there, the Alice Arm School, which is still there, 1922. Had 60 students at one time, and really is uh, one of the highlights of seeing Alice Arm. You can still see the names of the students on the wall. So they still got their little hooks with, you know, Annie and Ronald and Leon and that, still with their names on uh, the little hooks as you go inside the schoolroom with a little teachery upstairs as well. So uh, quite a unique uh, little building there. Um, in the mid-1940s, they replaced the uh, railway with the road to access some of the, um, the silver mines up there and still even have troubles today trying to keep that road open. It's just uh, such a hazardous place to, to build a road up in the canyons there. A lot of the, um, the connection to Antioch's with the, the Dolly Varden silver mine was they took a lot of the ore from there and uh, boarded it down the, uh, the Alice Arm to uh, Antioch's and smelted it up there. So he did have a post office, hotel, store in that. Um, as well and uh, was again one of your typical uh, you know one uh, resource towns these company towns um, and maybe it didn't have a necessarily a large company uh, behind it but uh, yeah it did have the post office there the I think it was the Falconer store the uh, the Dolly Varden Hotel I'll show you some pictures of that um, in a minute here so Alice Arm now um, still mineral exploration going on there Dolly Varden Silver still has a uh, an office there they are actually um, uh, still have flights and exploration that up in the, uh, the, the top ends of the valley there. So it still is quite active uh, in that sense. Um, Jeff Woolridge, who's our contact for Antioch and, Dolly, or and um, Alice Arm, actually has some water licenses up there. So they did have a small uh, dam at the headwaters of Kitsault Lake and uh, he still has the water license for that area and is hoping one day to produce um, some hydroelectricity from that area. Um, what else can I say about that? Now it mainly consists, I'd say, of summer cottages. Lots of uh, Albertans there that have purchased property and come there for the summer months, uh, you know, to enjoy uh, getting out in the, in the middle of nowhere, doing some fishing and recreating and that. So um, it really is a, a neat little place. And they have two year-round residents, so two individuals that live, year, uh, live there year-round, Charlie and Dana Fleener. I think they take off for about one month per year. And uh, they have an amazing place over the uh, overlooking uh, Alice Arm there over the, uh, the estuary. So what I'll do now is just show you a few pictures on Alice Arm. So this is one of the, uh, the uh, Dolly Varden Hotel that was there at one time. And this is actually the site of Charlie and Dana's place right now. They actually used a lot of the wood in this building when they tore it down uh, to build their existing house that they live in now. So just a magnificent uh, place overlooking the estuary and the, the uh, community. You can still see the... Uh, Part of the narrow gauge railway here as well. So another shot here of the uh, the railway um, that they had. 
taking all this silver out and the, the logs as well at one time up throughout the valley. Here's some very large uh, timber and trees and that that came from this area. A shot of downtown Alice Arm from the past. Doesn't look anything like this now, but uh, was a thriving little community. And this is uh, some shots of now. This is the Alice Arm Lodge. So Jeff Woolridge owns this and this is where some of our guests stay as at the uh, Alice Arm Lodge. Uh, look at this estuary, just magnificent. You know, if you're into exploring estuaries and sea life and birds and that, just a, a gorgeous place to, to get out and walk around. Um, when I was there last year, I spent a fair bit of time just walking around the, the little mud flats and that. Uh, so just a beautiful place. And uh, Kitsalt is actually just over here on the other side of the, uh, the arm. Aerial shot, so this is uh, what it looks like today as well. There's... Um, Jeff Woolridge is one of his houses, the uh, Blue Heron Gallery. You may have seen this in uh, Prince Rupert at one time. He barged that out and uh, brought it up to his property at Alice Arm. And then you can see just a little smattering of little uh, cabins and cottages and that. Uh, some old ones here from the early 1900s. Uh, this used to be the old bakery here. I think this store here was, or this house here is a cabin now, was from uh, the uh, early 1900s as well. The general store was right here. The post office as well. They actually had a, a little, um, show lounge and that just down here as well. So that's uh, kind of what it looks like today. And the Dolly Varden House, which is uh, <coughs> the old uh, dilapidated place now, but uh, still owned by the Dolly Varden uh, Mining Company, kind of a haunted house type thing that uh, you tromp around in. And the schoolhouse. And uh, like I said, here's uh, some old uh, new Canadian arithmetic books and uh, the, uh, the house is still in relatively good condition considering how old it is. So Antioch's, this is probably one of my favorite ghost towns of all five of them, just a, an amazing place, uh, lots of history. So this is uh, named after the Nishka word Anius, I'm not sure how I'm pronouncing that, but uh, um, which basically means hidden water, and it is kind of hidden. When you go to Antioch, you kind of got to go around a point to actually find the, uh, you know, the old site, the old town site. So, and they have a creek there called Hidden Creek because it was actually kind of hidden from the, uh, from the mountains and that. So um, that's where it got its name from. Brought into production 1914 by Granby Consolidated, so they had another copper smelter down in the Kootenays as well. And then uh, we're looking, that one was coming I think to a, the end of its life, and then they uh, were searching around and uh, ended up buying the license, uh, the mineral exploration licenses for, um, for Antioch's and started up uh, in 1914. This really was a, a company town, they provided everything there. All the housing, buildings, I think there was one store in the entire site, or site or entire town that wasn't a uh, part of the company. And a uh, couple of things about Antioch when they first started, a uh, couple of uh, good fortune things that happened. They were actually uh, uh, blasting the harbor to get some of the, uh, the ships in to make a deep water port for, for the, the ships, the coal ships and, and that that would come in. And they found this gold vein that uh, back then I think was worth $3 million worth of gold that they found. It basically paid to build the entire town. So uh, they had some pretty good luck there. They also found this special blue clay, or blue clay when they were uh, digging water lines in that and, and sewage lines in the community. And they were actually bringing this clay in from uh, other parts of, I think, the eastern US. And they used it to line the furnaces in the smelter. So that is um, uh, one of the other good fortune things that they had when they were building the town. One of the iconic <coughs> things about Antioch is this Eastwood multiple arch uh, dam that they have that they built to power the town. So it's just this, you know, you, you go up this four kilometer road, come around a corner and there's this massive concrete dam up there that, uh, you know, you can still, it's still in relatively good condition uh, considering how old it is. And it was the largest in Canada at one time. So it uh, really is a, an interesting sight to see that. And, um, you know, the town was modern, self-sufficient. It had uh, electricity, it had sewer and water and all these things that uh, many communities didn't have at the time. They were kind of immune to some of the world uh, forces as well and other things going on. And um, yeah, from most accounts, the company took care of the, uh, the people uh, quite well there. Had a population of over 2,500. Um, wasn't the greatest place to live in in some senses. Had these deadly sulfurous fumes. Basically killed every uh, ounce of vegetation in the area, you know, within 20, 30 kilometers of the place. You can still see the remnants, these old posts and sticks of trees uh, as you approach uh, Antioch by boat there. And uh, no wildlife, they had nothing to, uh, you know, to hide in, no vegetation, anything like that. Stories of bleeding noses and, you know, the kids being able to light the snow on fire in the winter because of all the sulfur. Like, and, you know, people only being able to work two hours in the smelters because the, the, uh, the sulfur was so bad. So um, a little story about stolen light bulbs where the company would 
um, stamps stolen on all the light bulbs that they, uh, that they used in the community because they didn't want the people that worked there to take them and use them in their houses. And you know, in the, in the Antioch's book, there's an interesting story about how the, the people were pretty conscientious, honest people, but the kids would go in and take an emery cloth and basically sand off the stolen off it so they could use it in their house. And other people didn't care if it said stolen or not, they still took the light bulbs and used them in their houses. And then the, the demise of Antioch's was uh, the Great Depression. Uh, the price of you know copper dropped. They had I think they said 18 months of copper stored on their um, <laughs> dock there. They called it the copper coffin, and that was basically the demise. The price of copper dropped, and and I think you know the depression had already started, but the people at Antioch had no idea on the outside world what was happening until 1935 when they finally shut down the, the smelter. So um, yeah, and then everyone had uh, you know moved out of town. The, the next seven years after that, between 35 and 42, they had a crew in there basically decommissioning it, taking all the metal and everything they could take out of the place. And then in 42, a large fire happened, come rolling over the hills. They took all the, ch the women and children and that moved them to an island, Larkham Island. And then uh, everyone else vacated as well. And anything that was wood there essentially had burnt in that fire. And what remains today is mainly just the concrete and metal structures that are there um, today. So now, you know, it's a very remote place, few visitors. Our group that went in there this August, I think uh, the owner, Jeff, and his sister were the only people that had visited it since we were there last year. So it is a very remote, it's privately owned, and we're lucky enough to have access uh, to go in there. Uh, Jeff is trying to, with his Antioch's hydroelectric company, wants to refurbish the dam and uh, start generating power. 30 megawatts a year is his plan, maybe running an underwater cable to uh, Kitsalt if they could get a, a LNG plant there. So, or even having an LNG plant at uh, Antioch. So it is this kind of this industrial wasteland type of site that, uh, you know, they bought some more property there, but uh, who knows, that's, uh, he's a businessman and uh, we're lucky enough that he'll house us there um, for the night when our group comes. Like I said, he's got LNG aspirations. And then uh, these educational travel tours, you know, we pay him a little bit for our group to come out there and stay overnight in his camp and for him to show us around. Um, there also is the slag, the remnants from the, uh, from the mine, this massive slag pile that gets mined right now and uh, they take it, sort it, sift it, water it down and then every few months a barge comes in and takes it away and they've been eating away at that slag pile there I think for the last 25 years so they figure they're about halfway through and they might have another 25 years of slag and what they use that for is shingles, you know the little particles of shingle, um, these little, I don't know what you'd even describe them but that's what they're using a lot of it for. They were showing me some of the samples of the, uh, the companies that use their slag on their shingles on their roofs. And they also use it for sandblasting. Of, uh, the US military buys a lot of the product as well and they use it for sandblasting all their armored vehicles and tanks and stuff like that. It comes from the, uh, the Antioch slag pile. So <laughs> some of the cool things there, the, you know, the dam, the powerhouse, which is a regional district recognized heritage site. Uh, the cemetery, just amazing. Um, you know, we brushed about a kilometer trail up to the uh, the cemetery, and you can still see the, you know, the gravestones and headstones of the little concrete or cement uh, helmets on a lot of them to uh, commemorate the veterans that went off to war. Um, the slag pile, coke plant, general store, and then just remnants of all kinds of stuff uh, lying around there. So some then and now, this is like I said, one of the iconic uh, things. There is the the powerhouse. You can see the uh, before shot and what it looks like now. Um, the slag piles over here. But you can see there was a lot uh, more buildings in that uh, you know, when this was taken, probably back in the 20s or 30s. Um, the coke plant, so here's an aerial shot of what the coke plant looks like now, what it looked like back then. So they did use coal as a supplementary uh, power source as well. So they brought coal in and you know in the winter months when the dam wasn't uh, producing as much water and that for hydroelectricity, they got supplementary power from, uh, from the coke or the coal. So uh, and there's some you know, they used to make all their own um, bricks as well. There's a brick furnace in here, like you know, hundreds or thousands of bricks still sitting in here. Just all kinds of uh, remnants that you can't see that are covered by the trees that uh, were there at one time. And some railway tracks as well that came through here. Um, so yeah, that's the old uh, coke plant. Another shot here of uh, what the town looked like. And uh, you know, we actually do have a couple of um, people in the room that took our tour. Bob and Linda Wilson were on it last year, and so this will kind of, uh, you know, when we walked up to the, the cemetery, which is this area right here, you know, we were just walking through forest most of the time, and you'd see remnants every now and again, but, you know, we'd be walking along, and you'd, you'd see, I think, in here somewhere, there was a bathtub and a sink, and then a fire hydrant up here, so you knew you were probably walking down this street somehow, but it's all in the forest, so 
it really is amazing that this is what it looked like at one time and we're uh, kind of bushwhacking around finding different uh, foundations and other concrete structures out there. So, and then this is uh, you know a sample of all the copper, the copper coffin, um, you know that was all sitting on the wharf and that a year and a half worth of copper that they just couldn't sell anymore. That uh, started piling up, and that was people started realizing that was the demise of Antioch when you know, something was up. That copper just wasn't getting shipped anymore. And then the dam. So we come around this the road down here, walk down, and there's the dam. Um, they're trying to recommission uh, for power. And, I mean, it is pretty cool. We get to go up and walk around up here. And I think I had one uh, guest last year, or this year, he was actually trying to walk across the, the top of it. And I had to tell him to kind of hold off. And if our health and safety people ever saw that, they'd, uh, they'd come <laughs> apart. But, and then we get to walk down inside. And you know, you can see the manholes, or the, the, uh, you know, where all the water's coming through um, at the bottom. They did blast a couple holes in here, just so that there wouldn't be any breaches over top to keep uh, the water flow in check. And there's some old pallets in here, all the bags of concrete cement that they brought up by railway. There never was a road up here. It was all brought in by this little railway from the coast or from the, uh, the four or five kilometers from the ocean up to, uh, to here to build this. Uh, so an amazing feat that in the early 1900s you could build a structure like this just with bag after bag of concrete. So <clears throat> another one of the powerhouse, just kind of an industrial, you go inside here and yeah, it's just iron and all kinds of stuff, just, it's, it's pretty intriguing. Uh, there's a couple of the guests from uh, this year, there's one of the, the fire hydrants I was saying, just out in the middle of nowhere, you'd walk by it if you weren't really looking closely, that, so you know you were on one of the streets there. Um, the cemetery, there's one of the little uh, concrete or cement helmets for one of the, the veterans. Um, this one here, there was a story behind this uh, gravestone that the I guess uh, one of the guys was from another country, I think it was even Yugoslavia or something, and he wanted to repatriate his wife, so he got permission to go dig her up and bring her back to his homeland. This is uh, the headstone of a, a young boy that actually drowned in, in the river there, and his brother tried to go rescue him, and uh, the water was so toxic that the men had to hold him back so he wouldn't go in and, uh, and grab his younger brother. And uh, Wilfred Sheldon Thiebaud, is his name. If you read the Antiochs book um, by Pete Loudon, you know, there's, there's a reference to this um, there as well. So, yeah, quite a unique little cemetery. And quite open as well, like, you know, for how long it's been, it's quite easy to walk around in there. So, Kidsalt, um, <coughs> modern day ghost town. Uh, this is probably the eeriest, I think, of all the ghost towns of the five, I find it. Um, most of you, are, I think, are familiar with this up in the, the Nass Valley. Um, or go through the Nass Valley and up through the mountains to get to Kitzel. It had two operating phases from 68 to 72. It had about 500 residents, sometimes called Silver City. And but even back then, it still had a pub and some other accommodations and uh, these mobile homes or modular homes at, um, at uh, Kitzel. And uh, then opened up again from 81 to 82 with uh, 1,200 residents. And this is when the company really put some effort into it with all the amenities um, you know, of a town that you could think of. So um, I did talk to the, the, care, or the, the caretaker, I guess, that uh, was there just after this had closed down in 68, 68 to 72, John Wheatley, and he had some interesting stories about living there basically in that period from uh, you know, 72 to 80 and, and actually looking after the place and uh, you know, them taking houses out of there. And actually there's still some of them in Terrace here that they uh, basically cut them in half and then put them on um, barges and that and barged them up and then had to close down streets and terrace and that to get these houses to their uh, foundations here. So a lot of them uh, did get removed and uh, sent elsewhere. There was I think eight of them that actually got swept down in a landslide, went down into the, to Alice Arm into the ocean with a D7 cat as well and they'll just float it out into the, to the ocean. So um, then yeah, that was with Kennecott um, Copper who had a molybdenum interest as well. And then in 81, 82, the price of molybdenum started going up again, or prior to that. And that's the was the problem with these resource towns. Molybdenum especially would go up and down like a yo-yo, you know, up over $30 a pound and then back down to less than a dollar. And the companies would get so excited, put all this money and effort in, and then it would drop right down after that. So, um, but this is really the interesting part here is all the amenities that they put in for these 1,200 residents for 18 months. And then it uh, basically, the price of, co or price of molybdenum dropped and uh, they basically told everyone to leave. And uh, it sat vacant with uh, a few different uh, um, companies. 
And then in 2004, uh, Christian uh, Sunathran bought the, uh, the place site unseen for 5.7 million and still owns it today. Still does all the maintenance, invests the, uh, the, the time and money into keeping this place maintained. It's had all kinds of ideas, this eco retreats and places for the great minds of the world to come together and fix the world's problems. And uh, um, you know, maybe even I think get some ideas for you know, doing some movies there. Um, yeah, just uh, kind of an interesting uh, gentleman. And one of the interesting things this year was just before we got there this year, um, we were in there having tea with Indu, uh, one of the, the caretakers, and she said, oh, Christian was here. And he said, he was here yesterday, I think she said. I said, oh, really, and how long did he stay for? Oh, an hour. So he lives in Virginia, flew all the way in, went to see his uh, community that he owns for an hour, asked how it was going, then basically left and uh, took off again. So he's got some ideas for, for some things. Uh, LNG is one of the things you'll see on the next slide that he's uh, hoping to get going there as well. So. But the amenities there are really the interesting things. Um, you know, all these things that have been maintained, rec centers, the gym, fitness center, all the apartments which our group stayed in. So we actually stayed in one of the, uh, the apartment buildings. There's like 92 houses still there, lots of foundations for, I guess it was for future expansion. You know, swimming pool and hot tub and library, you know, the movie theater, um, shopping center, you know, with the Sears and a post office and a laundromat and, you know, a bank, you're inside the bank vaults, the, uh, a grocery store. I mean, there's just all these uh, things that are just so eerie that uh, you just don't expect because there's no people around. You know, we're walking down the streets and you know all the lawns are mowed and maintained, and you just expect that you're going to see dogs or hear dogs barking or people walking down the street, but um, just nothing. So you know, the hospital, which I think uh, Kelsey had told me was they're they're pretty cautious, they're cautious about letting people go in the, the hospital. They let us. Uh, you know, roam around there and uh, you know take all kinds of pictures, and they're very hospitable towards us. Opened up all the buildings of the town and let our group uh, basically have free reign for a day to walk through and take pictures. So, so like I said, very exclusive. I mean, I'm very grateful that uh, they let us go in there and our group, uh, um, you know, wander around there and actually house us. They, you know, they get hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of requests to go into Kitsalt and you know basically don't respond to most of them. So. Uh, I know I'm grateful that they let us uh, go in there as, as part of one of our tours. Like I said, it's maintained, um, you know, quite well considering you know how many things they have to look after. The Avante mine is um, is uh, planning on uh, starting up again. I guess if the lignum prices go up, there's really not going to be much connection between the two. So um, they'll house all their people on site at the mine, and uh, kids all will be totally separate. The community, so I don't think they'll have much to do with each other. Um, Christian's still trying to get this export terminal. Um, at Kitsalt as well, um, so who knows what will happen with that. Um, you know, he wanted this research center there, the wellness center and retreats. Uh, he's planning on a documentary, so I had some emails from him there a few weeks ago and he's planning on bringing a film crew up and doing a full documentary on Kitsalt and the history and that. And he's an interesting uh, gentleman, he's got uh, his own uh, um, U.S. Um, political party called the Proud American Party and you can go online and check out what uh, his uh, platform is all about. Uh, he's the founder of Best Medical Group of Companies, so these medical uh, equipment and supply companies is where he gets uh, most of his money. So um, yeah, like I said, very uh, grateful that we get to go in and uh, explore around uh, Kitsault. So here's a few photos of Kitsault, the post office and, and that, you know, there's a bank <coughs> and a Sears and a sports store, there's the grocery store down here. Yeah, they're just eerie going in there and, and you know, really nobody around. Um, you know, here's the hospital. I mean, there's still uh, liquid in the IV bags in the <laughs> hospital rooms. There's still medications in that in some of the cupboards, the x-ray room. Um, yeah, lots of, uh, you know, and I encourage afterwards, talk to Bob and Linda who are here. They were on the tour and they'll probably have their own uh, um, stories and that to tell and what they thought was interesting and, and that from the place. But yeah, there's still, uh, I think Kelsey had mentioned when she was there, she, uh, there was still the notepads of the doctors that were there, and I think you actually interviewed them? Yeah, I spoke to um, one of the doctors on the phone who, so what happened, he said um, they built this like state-of-the-art medical center, but couldn't find anyone to work there. So they somehow tracked him down and asked him if he would. He just graduated from medical school, and he was intrigued by the adventure, but told them, no, he wouldn't do it completely by himself because there were a lot of young people who were having babies, so you'd need to be on call pretty much 24-7. So he said if they found him a partner, he would go. 
So he recruited his another friend from medical school, and the two of them went up, and he said it was like the most interesting time of his life, and he has this like idea of kids salt as paradise, and it was so wonderful. So they put all this money into this medical center. The two of them switched off every month and um, would take turns being there. And then Rob will tell you what happened, I guess. <laughs> but he very he was only there for a short time and then left. And yeah, so I'm I'm still planning to do a full interview with him. I just interviewed him on the phone, but. Yeah, and the, I mean, Kelsey was telling me where she got his name and contact information from the prescription pads. And they're still <laughs> sitting there on his uh, office desk there, all the medical books lined up, and, and that's still in his uh, office. So I took some pictures of that as well of some of the, uh, like there was two or three doctors' names I could find on the prescription pads that were still there. But um, yeah, really just a, kind of an eerie place going in there. This you know, shot of the library with the books still on the, uh, the shelves swimming pool, a uh, little gungy, but uh, still water in there. I'm not sure why they keep water in there in the hot tub in a kid's pool. And that, there's me practicing my curling <laughs> in the curling rink. And it's an uh, aerial shot. I mean, there's one of the, the little subdivisions with all the houses, you know, our group would walk down here and, you know, you, all everything's mowed and, you know, you could go inside the, the different houses and, and poke around if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, just kind of a there's a shot there where, like I said, you just expect there to be people and kids and animals and that, but uh, nobody there. So it really is an uh, interesting place. So I think um, we'll turn it over to Kelsey now, and she'll uh, do the Port Essington ghost town. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'm sorry for the squish space. Um, thank you also to Rob for organizing this. Um, so I'm here to talk about Port Essington. Um, gave a talk a little while ago, actually with Christina, who's sitting at the back, and she's probably much more of an expert than I am. So if you want to chime in on anything, Christina, please go ahead. <laughs> um, so Port Essington, um, the Somaliak name for Port Essington, so the Simshian language name is Spock Schutz, or Spoke Schutz, so that's been anglicized. I probably did not pronounce that correctly, but um, am I not standing in the right way? Alex? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so anyways, um, so this is the name, the traditional name for Port Essington, and the name means autumn camping ground of the Sim for the Simshian people from Kitsumkalem and Gitaus. Um So Port Essington has been utilized for thousands of years um, by people who would go in the autumn and um, stay there and um, use the resources. The story of Port Essington is very much a story of the historical context and of resource resource extraction once again, which is the story of all of these ghost towns and of a lot of Northwest BC. So can we move on to the next slide, Alex? Oh, I do it? Okay. Which one? Perfect. <laughs> um, so this is a photo of Robert Cunningham, who many of you are probably familiar with. Um, Robert C Cunningham was a missionary who um, forms a lot, who is a very important figure in the history of Port Essington. Um, so Port Essington was formed um, by, Port, by Robert Cunningham, but like I said, it had been there for thousands of years. So the fur trade in, the land-based fur, fur trade in um, the Northwest region began in 1832 in the Nass Valley, um, and that was called Fort Simpson. Then Fort Simpson was relocated two years later to where Port Simpson is today, um, which was also called Fort Simpson in the fur trade. Um, so the land-based fur trade was along the coast, just north of Prince Rupert. Robert Cunningham came here as a result of the fur trade. Um, so <coughs> missionaries were um, here to kind of um, save the First Nations people from the incursions of the fur traders and from various things. Um, Robert Cunningham arrived in Metlakatla in 1862 as an assistant to William Duncan, the Anglican missionary, who has a very fascinating story um, of his own. Cunningham served with Duncan for two years until he had a falling out, probably over ideological differences and possibly also over a young Simshian girl who um, Duncan married. He saw an opportunity over these two years in the people who were coming up the Skeena in search of gold, in search of land, in search of furs. And he used the preemption system, so kind of a homesteading system, to claim the 160 acres that became Port Essington. He renamed it Port Essington, um, which is interesting. Captain George Vancouver, when he was here in 1793, um, called the point of land Port Essington, 
after his friend, Captain William Essington, who had never been to the area, and it was kind of a dismissal. He decided that he came, he came inland from the coast and decided that uh, the Skeena and Extal rivers were rivers of no note whatsoever. They merited no further um, exploration and he turned back. So the name itself is kind of a dismissal. So it's interesting Cunningham named his town that when he was planning for it to be the <coughs> center of the Northwest. Um, so he, Cunningham, oh, this is a, a map um, of BC just to show you where we're talking about with Port Essington. Do I have a, I have a pointer? Okay, here we go. So here's the coast. Um, so people were coming from <coughs> Westminster in Victoria, which is kind of off the map, up along the coast. Um, they would go inland to Port Essington, which is here, and then um, coastal sternwheelers and boats would disembark, and then they would carry on to sternwheelers that were specially designed to the, for the Skeena River and go all the way up to Hazleton. So that gives you an idea of where Port Essington is. And this is um, Prince Rupert here. So this is a map of Port Essington. Um, so right away, Cunningham designated this section of land right at the center of Port Essington um, as reserve land, and he allowed First Nations people to settle there for free. Um, well, I guess it was an actual reserve, so um, they, were, they, own, they had ownership of the land. And then he sold the remainder of his settlement as lots to European settlers. So you can see the way he's um, cut it up into lots. <coughs> he built a store so this is another image of the Indian Reservation area. Um, Cunningham built a store, which is in the left foreground. I'm not sure exactly which building. Um, and he built a store right away that served miners who were coming in search of gold, as well as the settlers who lived in his area and who came to go further up the Skeena. He built a hotel, which you can see here. Um, a, what he called a great town hall to serve the community. Um, a cannery and a cold storage plant, and you can see his name here. He created his own currency, Cunningham dollars, which were made of brass and could be used for trading at Port Essington. Um, lots of people, does anybody in this room have any? They still are all around. My uncle has a couple, but he's never even let me look at them. So. <laughs> he's worried about the theft. <laughs> So here's another image of Port Essington, 1888. So Cunningham strategically located Essington at the threshold between the ocean and the Skeena, so that both boats that came up the coast from New Westminster, Victoria, as I noted, and boats that went further up the Skeena could unload and reload passengers. Um, so sternwheelers went inland from Port Essington as far as Hazleton, as I noted in the earlier map stopping at communities like Terrace and Kitsilis along the way. So Port Essington became a crucial access point of the Northwest, and this is an image of one of the stern wheelers at Port Essington itself. It also was a gathering site for Simshian people, as I noted earlier, so it was an autumn camping ground. Um, in the 1800s, we're talking mostly um, about the 1800s and early 1900s here, and in the 1800s, um, Simshian people were dealing with the decimation of their communities. They had lost up to 90% um, of their people. So they were dealing with um, total economic, political, spiritual, social upheaval as a result, cultural upheaval, um, and additional upheaval from missionaries, from fur traders, and from introduced alcohol. Many um, of those remaining 10% or so of the people came, converged at Port Essington as a result. It had always been an autumn camping ground, as I noted, so it existed already as a gathering site. But now, too, it became the site of canneries and the axis of transportation, so people were drawn to Port Essington and actually stayed at Port Essington for longer than their traditional seasonal round, but it did exist within their cultural tradition. So this is an image of the students at the Port Essington Day School. This is um, termed Indian Revival Meeting at Essington in 1897. And this is a wedding from 1931 that's in the United Church of Canada archives. There are a lot of photos on the United Church of Canada, in the United Church of Canada archives, which nobody um, has identified. Quite often, these photos will be taken by missionaries and then um, added into the archives, but nobody knows the names of the people, so they're trying to add names 
now to a lot of these photos. So if you recognize anybody or think you know somebody that might recognize them, please <laughs> ask them. Um, help these photos kind of be reclaimed. This is another street photo too. And this is a photo of the Indian Cemetery, which is just up on a knoll at Port Essington. Rob and I actually went to it, and I have a photo at the end of this presentation of one of the gravestones now. And you can still see some of, especially the iron um, pieces here, you can still see them covered in moss and fallen down, sometimes still standing. So it's, it's very interesting. So Port Essington was a resource-oriented cannery town. Um, there were different settlements. The town was segregated between Chinese people, Japanese people, First Nations people, German, English, and Finnish people. And I think I added the map again so you could see that. So this is the First Nations section. This here goes to Fintown, which was quite a bit outside of the town. And interestingly, Rob and I visited quite a few of the houses that are still standing in Fintown. Um, there are also Japanese, Chinese sections. So this is um, a photo right at the docks, and this is Joseph Restaurant. This is an image of the cannery section, so where all the cannery workers would have lived. And this is about 1926, so you can see all the boardwalks between <coughs> houses, and you can still see remnants of those in Port Essington. Um, sometimes you'll see like posts and sometimes you'll just see um, the coiled metal from water pipes. So they would have used wooden water, water pipes running between um, houses and only the co coiled metal that held those, wa those wooden water pipes together remains. So it was really interesting to stumble on that. So the town population ranged from several hundred people to over a thousand, possibly up to three thousand. Um, and it's fluctuated seasonally when people had come to work in the canneries or to fish for the canneries. There was a lot of speculation that the town would be the terminus of the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway. And when Prince Rupert was chosen, instead, in the early 1900s, <coughs> the town began to pause. So you had this large settlement um, with a very booming downtown. Um, so th the railway led to the collapse of the Sternwheeler traffic, which was crucial to Port Essington's economy. So at, at the point that the railway um, went to Prince Rupert, People were drawn away to Prince Rupert um, and away f were drawn to Prince Rupert away from Port Essington. Um, the economy stalled and um, everything kind of was drawn there. Um, eventually, a series of, ta of fires took its toll um, on the community and burnt up pretty much all of Dufferin Street, which I have. Here's Dufferin Street, so one of the main streets. <coughs> burned up almost every building on Dufferin Street in. 1961 um, and there were a series of smaller fires before and after that as well that took out the majority of the buildings there other buildings began to um, to fall back into the rainforest there still are a few buildings there but not that many there are a lot of relics of buildings though so. this is the Indian section with a large canoe and this is Frizzell's wharf um, he was the butcher so I have a photo later of Rob um, at this wharf. I'll show you that now. This is the boardwalk going up to the cemetery, um, the photo that we looked at of the Indian cemetery. This is um, Frizzell in his grocery store and he was the butcher also. He apparently did a lot of functions. <coughs> he also owned the hot springs just outside of Port Essington. So this is an image of the cemetery now. This is um, an Asian grave. I'm not sure whether it's Chinese or Japanese. Um, you can see the obelisk though in the face. Um, and a lot of the graves look like this, like completely overgrown and you can't always make up the letters. And then this is um, down at Frizzell's Wharf about, right Rob? Yeah. And there's Rob right there. So um, I don't know if you can see it, but all stationed in kind of the clay that's right below the docks, the posts, are these skulls of um, cows that Frizzell must have butchered there and then they just left them the bottom so pretty much a lot of this is kelp and then a lot of, there are a lot of skulls so it was really eerie and interesting to walk around I didn't put very many photos saying I already was going to talk a lot um, but I have lots more if you're interested after to see what Port Essington looks like today but a lot of it is just these pilings um, and then the odd house or boat or something like that yeah. so 
So thank you, and we'll pass it on to Ken. As uh, Rob introduced me, I was a planner with the City of Terrace. I was uh, formerly a planner at the Regional District. Part of my job at the Regional District was managing the Heritage Program. I give a lot of credit to my interest in history to my father, who some of you may know, Dave Newman, local helicopter pilot, been here for many years. And uh, I heard about many of these places from him before I ever saw them for myself. And so uh, my dad's a bit of a railway buff, uh, going back uh, in his family history. Uh, the railway and so this is one of those railway towns that I heard about from time to time. So uh, I did a 45-minute presentation earlier this year and uh, I'll try to squeeze it into 10 minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me if I uh, don't do that. Uh, quite so Doreen, um, and I guess I got a button I got a question, right? Okay, so that's just a shot of Doreen and the general store and where the uh, uh, train station would have been just out here, out there. It's now, uh, of course, gone. You have a laser in the middle, too. Oh, and okay. In the middle? If you want to use it to point. That little red. Oh, I went back <laughs> to the left. What did I do? Oh, Alex is fixing it for you. Sorry. I'm well, in the you. middle. Okay, sorry. <laughs> right. What do I need to do? Just Switch use the arrow, right? Alex? No, I'm trying to get back to my presentation. Oh. <laughs> I haven't put that up for you. There's my laser. Okay. So, uh, for some geographical context, uh, Terrace. Oh, cheers. Terrace is down here, and Doreen is up here. This is the Skeena River. Uh, so, uh, oh, I, I, I got to give one more credit here. Uh, a lot of stuff, I information I got, I got from a fellow by the name of Dennis Horwell. Uh, his parents owned the general store there, uh, and uh, he's. Uh, Elderly fellow lives in town here, and he gave me a lot of the information that I have here, um, and a number of the pictures. So, um, Doreen uh, is spelt with two R's. That's the first thing you'll notice. Uh, a lot of people spell it with one. It's misspelled many times. Um, this is uh, Doreen uh, um, in a uh, uh, closer view uh, with the district lots. Doreen, as we call it, is this District Lot 2500 in general. It's, uh, uh, there's, uh, um, this is what it looked like in 2006, an aerial photo. It wouldn't look like that now. <coughs> there's uh, an old mining road uh, that you can would walk down to get to Doreen. Um, so this is part of that mining road, uh, uh, still in, in, in reasonably good condition in some places. So this is the common. The one on the, on the left here is the one that uh, people would uh, use more commonly. It branches off, the original road branches off, uh, and this is what the uh, uh, original road goes down to Doreen looks like now, or did in 2011, uh, but, it, and, but this peak one branches off and goes down towards uh, the tracks, different location. So a little closer look at Doreen. Uh, consists of about uh, uh, 15 uh, lots, there's two small lots there pointed out where the school and the store is. Um, so key individuals, uh, Mr. It's Tom is named after Ernest J. Doreen. He's a, he was a New Zealand uh, engineer who worked for the railway. He was contracted uh, by the Grand Trunk Pacific. Uh, Doreen started out as a work camp, which he supervised. So it was just a construction camp on the construction of the railway. Uh, census information will tell you, uh, identifies him as the uh, guy at, uh, at Doreen, uh, in the old census information. So um, uh, there's some, several newspaper clippings you can follow of his movement around. He worked in a number of different places, worked uh, eventually, I think, for the PG&E uh, railway uh, on the, uh, in the interior for a while as well. So he is sort of the, the, uh, the guy that sort of started uh, Doreen, I guess. Um, here's a map, a promotional map of the Grand Trunk Pacific, and uh, tried to point out Doreen there. Oops, I got to use the laser. 
Um, and uh, this is a promotional map that the Grand Trunk Pacific put out saying, come settle in our region. And uh, identify. Uh, another person uh, of significance is Charles Carpenter. Uh, call him the founder of Doreen. Uh, he's the one that preempted District Lot 2500 uh, in 1911, subdivided it into 15 lots, uh, registered plan of 2013, homesteaded himself on Lot 10, sold his first lot to uh, Thomas McCubbin, Lot 3. Uh, uh, talk more about Mr. McCubbin in a little bit. In addition to farming, he also was a cut cedar pole, a very common practice in, uh, in, in the area at the time. Died in 1930. Carpenter Creek, which is just to the south, uh, was named after Mr. Carpenter. So here's a subdivision, uh, that's a copy of the subdivision plan. Uh, and this is uh, some information of people who actually bought the various lots uh, over, over uh, off Mr. Carpenter over time. So Mr. McCubbin, uh, the guy that bought the first lot, he is significant in the history of Pacific. Uh, he owned the store in Pacific and he at the time and he wanted to have a store in Doreen that's why he bought that lot so he built the store uh, at, uh, in 1920 and he owned the store until 1935 and 36. Uh, Lewis Noss another significant uh, person uh, the prospector came to the area Noss Mountain you see Noss Mountain in this picture that's Noss Mountain up here uh, uh, he staked the, the Fiddler claim in 1912 on Noss Mountain, developed the mine uh, uh, claim and built a road up to the mine in 1914. Eventually uh, was bought out uh, and then the mine operated periodically till 1950s. And so uh, mining was a big component of, of, uh, of Doreen as well as uh, the railway. Uh, this is Dennis Horwell's parents, uh, William and Florence Horwell. They moved to Doreen to manage uh, um, uh, Thomas McCubbin's store in 1924. He was originally, uh, Mr. Uh, Horwell was a telegraph operator and I think he spent some time in Salvis as a telegraph operator between Terrace and Prince Rupert. Bought lot 11 off Charles Carpenter and was did some farming while his wife was uh, basically ran the store for him and the post office. Uh, Mr. Uh, Horwell was uh, a lot of things. He was uh, the post iron master. He was uh, just as the piece. He was a sub mining recorder. He did a lot of things. He, uh, the store was very central to uh, 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 to Doreen. Uh, he eventually bought the store off of Mr. McCubbin, uh, 935 more 36, and the information isn't quite that detailed. Uh, operated the store until he died in 1958, uh, and his wife later sold the store to. Uh, fellow from, from Smithers. Um, they did a lot of farming. Uh, they had greenhouses, uh, sold uh, uh, vegetables and uh, produce and uh, flowers and that was kind of perennials to, uh, to people in Prince Rupert and those down the line towards Terrace. Rail, it was a railway community first. Um, Grand Trunk Pacific Station was built in 1913. That's Mr. Horwell's photo here. Station with a store in the background. Uh, existed until 1970. The CN tried to sell it to the people at Doreen, the few that were there in the 1970s, for a dollar if they would just move it. They didn't want to move it, and so they burned it down, so it no longer exists. Uh, many of the residents were employed by the railway. Uh, you can look through the history of that. And it was the only transportation really in and out of the valley until the highway was built uh, until uh, across the way on the other side of the river. Um, Doreen was largely a farming community, as I said earlier. Uh, many of them uh, were, were farmers strictly, uh, or tried to be. Uh, um, this is a picture from, of, of strawberry fields from the uh, Canadian archives. Um, like I said, Horwell's had a large greenhouse. Apparently the greenhouse, a lot of glass from the greenhouse came from uh, uh, Pacific. Uh, they had a roundhouse in Pacific that uh, they had a bunch of glass windows from that they managed to obtain there to build their greenhouse. This is uh, Doreen from the air. <laughs> the railway would be going right this way. Uh, you can see that there, there was the station within about there. Um, so you can see some uh, <coughs> fields and farming all over the place. The highway, of course, is the bottom of the picture. 
Durin was a mining town. Placer Gold was uh, first discovered in Durin just to the north. Uh, Fiddler Creek Mine, I talked about Mr. Lewis uh, Noss. Uh, give you some statistics about the amount of uh, ore that came out of the, out of the mine. Uh, the, really, the boom time was uh, in the 19, uh, 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 late 1940s to early 50s before the mine closed. That's, Mr. Horwell actually worked in that mine and became a mine engineer and uh, spent some time living there. It actually had an interesting 2,800 foot uh, uh, um, aerial tram across Noss Creek from the mine, uh, which was up in the. Up, up, uh, <coughs> Noss Creek. Um, what mineral was taken out of the Noss? Um, well, a lot of a lot of a lot of gold, <coughs> and copper, and silver. It's just nothing. You know, one particular uh, um, uh, mineral. Let's see, so there's so just give you some perspective. Doreen's here. This is a map from 1961. So Doreen's here. You can see the road on there, and these were the claims just up Noss Creek. So this is Fiddler Creek here. It flows into the Skeena, and Noss Creek is this, and so those were the claims were. And this is the tram went down across Noss Creek here somewhere, I don't know exactly where it happened. Doreen General Store, there's Mr. P picture of Mr. Horwell as a young man during the 1936 flood in front of his parents' store. Uh, it was the center of town. I mentioned some of this already, operated until 1960. That's what it looks like today. And during school, uh, started in 1916, uh, Mr. Charles Carpenter gave the, the land for the school. Uh, they really had tr trouble keeping enough kids there, often having to read stories about the uh, school not being able to uh, stay open. The school district had a minimum number of kids, and they used to have to fudge numbers and bring kids that were, you know, four years old and make them students uh, to get to keep the numbers going. Uh, last teacher was Mrs. Uh, Ellen uh, Gray. Uh, was a tourist destination uh, most recently. Dorian Enterprises bought the, the property where the store was. They tried to, uh, uh, their family from California attempted to have a tourist and fishing lodge. Never quite made it. Uh, was that successful? The latest, the last one after that was the Seven Sisters Ventures. Somebody you will remember Seven Sisters Ventures and the grand plans. Uh, Art Bates involved uh, with the Hut to Hut uh, uh, hiking and uh, proposed bridge across the Skeena and a whole bit. Uh, it was a big deal in the newspaper around here for, for a little bit in the, in the 90s. Never came to fruition. So here's just some of the buildings today. Uh, so uh, this is Tom Hennessy's place. I'll show you a, a picture of what it used to look like with Tom Hennessy standing in front of it. This has all been fixed up by the Stewart family from Kidnap. This is, uh, was uh, uh, Horgan House. Uh, he was a railway uh, um, foreman, I believe. This house is a carpenter home. Uh, interesting note about this one. You heard of the 100 mile diet. People who own the 100 mile, uh, invented the 100 mile diet, wrote the book. They own this property now. This is the Leak home. Um, Bruce Webb's house, he was a fellow from Prince Rupert, fisherman from Prince Rupert. Um, uh, this is uh, right next door to the store. It's the Olson home. There's a list that you can go into, into uh, Wrigley's directories or BC directories and you can see a list of all the people and what they did uh, lived in Doreen. And you can just Google that and you can find all kinds of interesting stuff. So some of the names. And there's Mr. Hennessy in front of that same cabin uh, in 1950. That's, that's it. I could talk more about Do Lauren Creek and Pacific <laughs> if you wanted to, but we'll... Uh, you're out of the time. So yeah, so thanks for uh, coming out. We have some, uh, there's some materials at the back there if you're interested in sticking around and talking to uh, myself or I'm not sure if Kelsey and Ken can stick around for a bit, but if you have any other questions or anything, we can certainly uh, answer any of them as well. And um, yeah, I'd just like to say one of the other um, Things. If any of you have ideas for educational tours, educational travel tours, I'd love to uh, hear about them. We're planning on a couple more um, next year. Uh, canneries of the uh, North Coast, down out of uh, Castiar Cannery, and going to Port Essington and uh, out to Osland and Una River, um, Carlisle, uh, Claxton, um, North Pacific, all those ones. So we've been out in the last uh, month actually looking at those, and then possibly a. Um, 
kind of recreating the uh, the Sternwheeler's trip from Hazelton to Port Edward, so spending about a four or five day on jet boats floating down and stopping at all the different places. At, uh, you know, going to Doreen, uh, we go to Kitsilis Canyon every year with Webb Bennett, and they give us a great tour of uh, the historic site there, um, incorporating some more of the First Nations stuff, maybe at um, Kitsigukla and uh, Kiwanga and that as well. So that's another one that we're hoping to get off the ground for next year. But we're always looking for new ideas, even if they're shorter ones, you know, one day ones or a couple day ones, finding out what people are interested in and what might, uh, you know, tweak the interest of other people in the area. Before we break up, we can probably take five or ten minutes of questions if uh, folks have uh, particular questions for any of our Question presenters. Question for Rob, uh, uh, about uh, Alice Arm, is the, uh, are there docks there where the public can take their boats in and visit? Yeah, docks, are, they have a dock there and you're, uh, you're more than welcome. It's not a private place. You can go in and uh, go into Alice Arm. Everyone there is very friendly, so in the summertime you'd probably find uh, maybe a dozen people there uh, that have their cottages and that and they make you feel at home they'll invite you in for uh, coffee or tea and even when I was there that you know it was like we were hoping to go and source out and find other things but there were so many people that wanted to talk to you invite you in for a beer or something and yeah so very uh, friendly people and I'd encourage yeah Alice Arm uh, you know if you're in there with your boat pop in and you know, even Antioch, I'm not saying go visit it, but you can definitely go out in the harbor in front of Antioch and see all the different things. There is a gentleman there that's there year round um, that runs the slag pile, and uh, he's a super nice guy as well. And if you went up to the slag pile, and you'll see his uh, building there with all the conveyor belts and uh, going in to chat him, he'll probably invite you in as well. When we were there, it's like you can't leave kind of thing. They have no one to talk to, so they're just <laughs> any conversation other than the two of them. It's uh, so he's. Uh, a super nice guy as well so it is it is an interesting place to you know to go by and, and see and Doreen you can go to Doreen as well it's uh, you know you can go in by like, people going by ATV or uh, by boat so it's you know, I encourage you to you know if, and if you're interested in going on our tour we'll be running it again next year but uh, yeah encourage people to get up and investigate themselves yeah uh, when the sold for the 5.7 it was one of the uh, the mining companies. I can't remember if it was Amax. I think was the name of the company. I'm not sure, but I think so. yeah. But and they used to own the mine also, and they they finally divided decided to divest them so that like the, it used to be one unit, the mine and the town site. And they finally divested it and then sold off the town site and the mine to separate people. But there's still there's a bit of controversy <laughs> there because the mine still has access. Avante um, now owns and has access to the right of way through the middle of town down to the dock. So. I know uh, Christian was trying to not give access to the mine to go through town as he thought it would disrupt the, the, you know, the nature of the place and that. So they were still in court, I think, um, battling over who gets right away of that main street that goes down to the... Uh, but the, the residents of Alice Arm, the only way to get to Alice Arm, or the easiest way, is to basically just go across the harbour. So if you're a resident of Alice Arm, you get a key to the gate at Kitsall and you're allowed to go down and park. You still have to pay a you know, parking fee. It's, it's you know, I don't know, five or ten dollars a day. You have a little box there that you pay. But So you can drive through Kitsalt if you are a uh, resident of, uh, of Alice Arm and then you can go from their dock over the dock at Alice Arm. So that's one way some people, <laughs> I don't think they encourage you to, you know, basically just stay on the main road and go through. Um, you know, even Jeff Woolridge, the guy who owns a lot of the properties at Alice Arm and Antioch, He's never even done a tour of uh, Kitsalt. He just drives straight through the town and uh, goes down to the dock. So you have to be lucky. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Rob, do you want to go in? Yeah. Any other questions? Is there any books that you've uh, you would have made for about your tours and stuff? We have a couple at the back of the Ghost Towns tour that uh, were put together. Um, there's a YouTube video I can put that on after too that we have of a bit of a you know, an idea of what it looks like with some photos and that, but um, we do have kind of, it's more of a photography type book at the back there that one of the, um, the guy who led the tour for us the first year put together, but there's lots of good resources there, like the uh, Klondike of Eskina, the one that Kelsey uh, um, told me about, it's an excellent book. Um, there's one there on, um, that Daryl Meralt has written on, uh, on the Dolly Varden, the, the Pete Loudon one, um, as well on Antioch, so I got a copy of that at the back, and so there's, there is some, a few books out there on the history of these places that, uh, yeah, once you get into it, I can't say that I was really a history buff in school, but now that you're actually seeing these places and reading and visiting them, it really is intriguing what happened. Uh, Where would you be able to purchase them? You can't purchase most of them. Most of them are out of print, but you can get them at the library, oh, <laughs> at the public library. Almost all of them, I think, are available at the library, and there are a few that are still in print. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I go on to eBay or Amazon and get them used. And I mean, even the Antiochs one, I think I've bought a dozen of those now. And I used to get them for like eight, ten dollars a book. And now I see they're up to thirty or forty dollars. You're probably so. driving your own price up. <laughs> <laughs> so I just keep waiting for them to come out every month or so. I check and see if there's any for that ten to twenty dollars, and then I, I'll buy them off of. Uh, with Amazon or eBay when people oh. are selling them. But they are out there you know, every now and again in the library. Well, it sounds like there's enough material here and enough interest in the topic that maybe uh, we're describing a new project that someone will take up and uh, in fact publish a, a book describing this, this rich heritage resource in our region. Join me again in thanking our speakers for a very uh, interesting <laughs>